Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. It's four o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon, which means it's time for, for Dr. Chris to start talking about some topic on SRI's Facebook feed. So hopefully we'll be getting a load of folk coming through, joining the stream. So welcome to those that are already waiting in bated breath. Um, and uh, I look forward to answering loads of uh, interesting questions about water management. Um, but we've got a guest um, on the stream this week. We've got, uh, we've got Dr. Tom Young. So Tom, do you want to introduce a little bit about yourself? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those who don't know me, Tom Young, I've uh, been at Estuary for about six years now and uh, work very closely with Chris in the research department. Um, my role at the moment is looking at all kind of new technologies, all exciting new technologies for the turf industry and, and I think um, outside of turf as well. Um, and my background was actually in green roof technology, so I'm a bit of a green roof buff. Anything involving vegetation or water on roofs um, gets me very excited. So, uh, um, yeah, here today to talk about water generally, um, because that's one of, uh, well, both mine and Chris's passions. We do seem to spend an awful lot of our life talking grass, talking techie, and a lot of it's talking water. So today should be, we'll try and keep it, we'll try and keep it on schedule. Hey, it's me guys. I do like to talk. And it's when Tom and I get going, we could be, we could be here for a while, but it's going to all be good stuff. And we look forward to some really great questions from you guys. So please, if you've got a question, just type it up in the comments. We'll then uh, flag up and answer as many of these questions as we can do as we go through. So um, to start off with Tom, um, what, what is water management? What does water management even mean? Yeah, it's it's a kind of it's quite a strange term, isn't it? In uh, to me, it means anything really, anything to do with water. And water's water is pretty straightforward and simple in the sense of it comes down and it, it follows gravity. Um, and water management on a whole site basically means water entering the site and then leaving the site and pretty much anything in between. And that goes from water to keep plants alive, which obviously from a turf point of view is pretty key, but also when water becomes a problem. Um, and even it's hard to kind of imagine uh, what four or five weeks ago, big problems across the UK with water with too much of it. And then, you know, now we've uh, we've not got enough of it. Um, and then of course, anything as well in between aesthetic golf uses water to its advantage from a uh, hazards point of view and also making things look pretty. Um, and so, yeah, pretty much from the beginning to the end of a, of a site, water is key, um, but obviously it can become a problem. Anything in life, you have too much of a good thing, it becomes a bad thing. Absolutely. And, and, and I guess with most things in life, it's all about balance, isn't it? And I think that's a, that's a, that's a major, um, a sort of a major recurrent theme in most things in life. Balance, balance, balance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's that's essentially what um, a cornerstone of pretty much all turf management is about is that balance. Um, root zone uh, selection is a really good example of that. Um, you're trying to get rid of water, but at the same time, you're trying to hold on to it as well. So you're constantly having these kind of conflicting, um, conflicting arguments um, with the water. What do you do with it and where do you store it? We've got a really interesting question here straight out the box from Eric. Thank you very much, Eric, for a, sort of a, a thought-provoking question. How important is a PGR program towards water management? That's something slightly out of left field. That's that's a really interesting question. So, Tom, you got any thoughts on that? I've got a few that I might I might share. Yeah, well, I guess it's it, very interesting. I suppose um, from a plant growth regulation point of view, you're actually slowing down that um, the growth of the plant. You're slowing down how much leaf is produced from a, a grass plant so i'm not sure how has there been research done looking at evapotranspiration rates under a, under turf under a plant growth regulatory i mean um, I, I think that's an interesting question and i'm not i'm not sure i've come across any that's for sure which is focused on sort of the effect of pgrs on on evapotranspiration rates and water efficiency if you like but you could imagine that if if 
plant biomass production and growth is lower, then there is potentially less demand for, for water. So that's an interesting question. I, and, and I'd like to hear uh, any any comments and, and, and sort of any thoughts on that as we go through the stream from, from uh, you know, greenkeepers, groundsmen that, that have had some experience and got some firsthand sort of expertise that they'd like, to, they'd like to put forward on that because it's not something that often gets thought about, but giving it no. some deeper thought, it could be interesting. Because inherently, I'd say that um, it probably would reduce water water demand, and that's from a lot of the work we've obviously done with plant growth regulators over the years at SGRI, um, where a good uh, um, plant growth regulatory um, program, if implemented correctly, can kind of make the turf much more hardy against certain certain stresses. Um, and water stress, you'd imagine it would be good going there as well. It, the plant would be much more resilient to any kind of localized stresses. And I think we've seen that, haven't we, Tom, o almost sometimes once we've finished with plant growth regulator trials, when you turn off the tap, which is everything, which is in which is water and nutrient, and you look at those plots which are left and they the, the most resilient, chances are it's the ones that have, have had the plant growth regulator programs applied. So there's definitely might be something in that and, and there's certainly some merit worthy of some further thought. Again, talking about how we can look at marginal gains to give overall benefit. So interesting question, Eric. Great question. Let's keep them coming. And and here we have we have erstwhile SGRI agronomist Gwyn Davis with a with a with a with a with a, with a comment. Um, less top growth means more energy for root mass increase. Therefore, drought tolerance in, uh, improves. Yeah, and and I think that goes hand in hand. That that we're gonna a PGR program is going to potentially be beneficial in situations where we, we may be more prone to stresses. But of course, the same thing is we've got to be careful with any uh, program that a part of our key job as turf managers is to help manage plant stress. We don't want a stress plant. A stress plant is an unhappy plant. Um, so again, it's it's managing all the different stresses that come along. But it is an interesting case in point. Thanks, Gwyn, for, for, for your comments. Um, so Tom, We've had a we've had a pretty uh, up and downy past twelve months weather wise, water wise. What's your what's your what's been your take on it? Yeah, well, I think we could probably if we even go back further, it goes back twenty four months. Um, and I know we're gonna we're gonna talk about climate change in a bit because it's it's an obvious topic to talk about. But what we've had in the last twenty four months has been a bit of a a microcosm of what people are predicting. It's going to become more the norm. So obviously, two years ago we had that um very long dry summer one of the the worst droughts in the last what 20 30 years but then followed up this year with a very um well essentially it was very mild and winters have been getting milder but that mild november december period i think we barely had a frost um at bingley hq before christmas a few after christmas and then a very wet february march so um very good for disease development um in kind of all walks of life no hard frosts to kind of really um harden harden anything off so but this year i think was a uh, worse than um than previous years in terms of just the sheer kind of amount of rain and con constant kind of rain that was more the problem i think the total amounts obviously were high but it's just that there was just literally no let up um and then we're at a HQ, we're on a very free draining site on a hill and we were having some serious problems with machinery. So um, obviously, yeah, thoughts go out to people in in kind of bottom of valleys, et cetera, uh, where there's some serious problems. And then obviously, if you're on floodplains, some serious longer term issues when rivers burst their banks, et cetera. So it's not just about that kind of immediate after the um, the rain. But then again, it, it's gone weird again. I'm currently based down here in Cambridge. And if you're going out running in the fields and stuff, we've not had a drop of water for probably about five weeks now and some of the cracks that are opening up in um obviously great growing conditions down here quite nice sandy loam soil but we're getting some serious big cracks here um and i've seen some of the farms actually getting their irrigation booms out already setting them all up um so that followed by um you know wet followed by drought it's just extreme one extreme to another which is probably the worst case you can have and and I think that's that's hit the nail on the head. Is it's been a, such a year of twenty four months of extremes um, and things that just keep on rolling in terms of very hot, dry, very wet, very hot, dry, very wet, mild and wet, 
a lot of wet and i think so sort of that certainly characterized the, the the lead up to this spring which so far has been pretty darn dry and i mean i look out my window here in a in a gloriously sunny yorkshire um and yeah it's uh, our ground staff at bingley hq are irrigating and that's that's not a common thing for april i can i can i can tell you so we've got a few more questions coming up here um so it's quite good to we'll have a little run through some of them so uh scott has uh, put a question up how do you manage going from being flooded for four months to, to, to bone dry for the last two weeks or so with regards to wetting agent penetrant penetrant usage um that's a really pertinent question and i think wetting agents uh, are a significant tool in our armory um over this well really tw 12 months a year um and, and reality using perhaps different products or, or different solutions for different challenges that we're facing um, so, Tom, have you got any, got any, any sort of thoughts about wetting? Yeah, I was going to say, there's, um, I suppose in some cases you have to be realistic as well. Um, we're, we're both obviously keen advocates of a, a long-term wetting agent program. We've seen the benefits of that time and time again on trials where get it in early and you reap the rewards later on and going into the next season as well. But at the same time, um, this year was a good example, February, March. There's no amount of wetting agent you could apply you kind of beat soil physics or precipitation event so it's kind of being um kind of a bit more practical sometimes in reality if it's rained for six weeks you can spray a wet agent but it's not going to help the bigger picture um whereas now going to bone dry that's that period of time where if you try and get ahead of the curve that's where the wet agents will make that you know a much bigger difference uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, you can't if you if you don't have space for, for water to go somewhere, you're not going to get it through. So I think penetrant usage and, and uses of wetting agents during the winter months is a really useful tool. But ultimately, when it comes to you still have to have a positive outlet, a positive outflow, which water can get to because we can't put water into the profile as quickly as we can do if it just hits the, 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 the traffic jam somewhere in the profile. So that's got to go hand in hand with long term water management, which is in winter months drainage and making sure that we've got sufficient drainage. So it's all about providing sufficient capacity to cope with all the rigors and extremes we get thrown. And really sort of uh, guys now with with wetting agents, um, it's critical now with with potential restriction, well, with restrictions on what we can do on, on golf course and sports pitches, looking to minimize maintenance inputs. Um, appropriate usage of, of, of products to help support irrigation so that when we do irrigation, it can be as effective as possible. We're not allowing localized dry spots to be coming in, fairy ring to start popping up. And all of that stuff, probably probably we should have started, well, been, been thinking about that back in, back, in, back in March time. So if you haven't got your wetting agent program sorted, it's pretty 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 darn good time to make sure that it's in and irrigated in because i think we've got to see, need to see the benefit of that especially if we're not seeing rain the plant's been using the water stock that's been held in the profile for a while but now that's gone and the soils are drying out we could be in trouble so uh, scott that's a really great question I mean, um, just to add to sorry just to add to that as well chris I mean, we've done obviously a lot of work as well on um looking at wetting agent usage at this time of the year with new seedlings and there's obviously a lot of concern with a kind of leaf scorch and, and seeds and and generally i think we found that if it's used appropriately not too high rates you know the two can go hand in hand with kind of renovations as well um for that kind of period of time if you're if you're worried about that localized dry spot that might start popping out now and you put your seed down and you want to kind of go hand in hand then that can be a nice option as well eric's eric's come back with a with a with another great question um, which is kind of a bit more related to sort of ongoing development work, which is having done some USGA growings, um, is likely that the construction methodology may change in future to account for demand for water savings. And we'll, we'll come on to that later on, especially in, in, in different climates. Um, yes, definitely going to be climatic variations needed. Would ceramic products like Axis and uh, Permapore ever be included in the materials? And, and um, and has there been any research that's that's been done on these materials? Well, there has been quite a bit of research done, and and I guess it very much depends on the climate you're looking at and the, and the sort of where your the, the the 
veracity, if you like, of the drying conditions and the water stresses that come on as to the benefits that are going in. And I think undoubtedly you can get benefits, probably when you put them pound for pound with benefits from organic matter. Um, the organic matter will give you probably more water retention because it's doing something in a slightly different way. However, in climates where that organic matter might not hang around for very long, then that's where your inorganic amendments can be really beneficial to help maintain a degree of water holding um, over a period of time. So I think it's making sure you've got the right solution for the challenges in that particular climate. So I think there's there's certainly good research out there um, to show the benefits, but also to show the, that we really do need to match to the circumstance as well. So that's a good question, Eric, another cracker. Two on the two on the trot from you, so that's a, that's a great effort. Um, and, and Chris Wood from uh, Hollins Hall, um, just across the, the the valley from us in Bingley, uh, in Bailden, says one mil of rain in the past four weeks. So, uh, and that's that's Yorkshire for you. And we, we, we do like a bit of rain in Yorkshire. And I think that same pattern is, is across the whole country, more or less. It's been for a large part of the country quite dry over this past month or so. So that, that, that leads to some major challenges. Gary, you've got a great question. I've seen that there. I'm going to come back to that question later on, I think, because I think it directly relates to some of the stuff we're going to talk about a little later on, perhaps some of the more left field, out the box thinking in terms of, of water usage. So, Tom, we've talked a little bit about sort of the past 12 months. We've talked a little bit about what's going on right now. So what does the future hold for us? What, what, what is the, what's the future going to look like from a water management point of view in relation to things like climate change, for example? Yeah, well, it's, it's one of those kind of really open-ended questions. It, it really does depend where you are in the country. Um, but essentially, as a, as a take-home message from, and if you ever go on um, any of these prediction websites, the Environment Agency have got some really nice uh, infographics, Met Office as well. Um, and we're going to come on to this in a bit as well when we talk about some of the work we're doing where we're hopefully going to um, start bringing some of these to life as well for, for green keepers. But very generally, what we're going to see is more what's happened in the last few years, much more extreme events. Um, so total amount of rainfall may not necessarily change too much. It may go down in some areas, it may go up in some areas. But what we're likely to see is um, that rainfall coming when it is dropped it dropped in a much shorter period of time um, and then conversely when you don't get any rainfall you um you don't get any for a long period of time so from a water management point of view it's it's the worst case essentially and um, when it does come down it's great for 10 minutes and then it suddenly becomes a problem um but then when you don't have it you, you know it's great for the first week or so and then you're suddenly starting to get a bit worried because you're going to run out of water so that's um kind of a very general uh, take-home message and it's it's kind of one of those things that climate is um obviously such a complex beast but you you look at some of the predictions and for example the the change in average air temperature isn't what you deem as dramatic um, maybe only a couple of degrees, but the effect that has has such large reaching effects on everything else and rainfall in particular, because that is so affected by air temperatures, air movements, um, you get some serious, serious changes. And I think some really good, there's, there's two um, two things I suppose to point out. One is that the the optimum region for growing champagne potentially, I think is already happening, is, is becoming the south of England. And um, that's happened in the last 10 years. Uh, English white wine. I don't know if you sampled any, Chris. That's become uh, <laughs> become uh, become quite popular. I think there's even well, there used to be a, a vineyard up in Home Firth, so that's not even that far south. So that's happening. Um, and on the other hand, there's a stat that um, I think at university we always got rammed home with was London actually receives less rainfall um, on average a year than sort of places like Cairo in terms of total rainfall so there's already a water shortage um, and there's an uneven distribution of water across the UK in terms of time and also location and those problems are only going to get worse and there's a lot of seriously worried people in places like the Environment Agency and, and water companies as well because there's going to be problems um, for, from a countrywide point of view and golf's obviously at one very small end of that spectrum um, but some of the things that golf really does need to do show that we are custodians and we're kind of thinking about this and we're not part of the problem we're actually helping to be part of the solution no, i couldn't agree more and i think 
that's part of certainly uh, and you're you're leading the project the golf course 2030 initiative um and and the sort of the, the work that's that's being done the project you're running which is which is looking at water water management and and, and how the water landscape is going to change in the future and i i absolutely agree we, we as an industry in, in, in the sports industry as a whole i think we we have great potential um to do an awful lot not only for ourselves but for the wider landscape whether it's urban or natural and i think there's a huge amount of intrinsic value that comes out from our managed sports surface because it does exactly what it says on the tin. It is a grassed natural area that will absorb, it will use, it will buffer, it will store, it will attenuate water to help with that sort of um, whole, if you like, urban water management landscape. Yeah, exactly. I think mean, sport and turf in particular does get a bad rep. Um, and I was probably guilty of it before I joined S2I. Golf is a very easy, um, you know, um, industry to, to beat with a stick and obviously there's always going to be bad bad cases um, and the thing that really opened my eyes with joining the SGI is that obviously a UK golf course is nothing like what you see um, on TV for the Masters etc you know majority of UK golf courses are actually very frugal with resources and for good reason um, economic reasons and also that's the way that that landscape should be managed uh, be it water fertilizer etc and I think you're a good point you were saying as well about the urban kind of landscape as well. And that's one thing I think we often um, sport doesn't do enough to shout about is the positive potentially it can do um, for the wider landscape. And I was actually on a call with our uh, one of our lead designers, Mike Rowley, this morning, and we were just chatting a bit about some of the designs we're doing on a few pitches. And um, I think we'll come on to designing pitches above and beyond what they do, but a normal football pitch in a in a normal situation has as you said a fantastic capacity to absorb water uh, and there's been some nice work done um uh, we've been involved in it ourselves showed that a standard football pitch can actually be a net contributor to the local area from a water point of view uh, rain that falls on that area is much less like less likely to enter into the sewage system than say rain falling on a road someone's garden etc like that and but i think often people see football pitches as um something that people play on and not something that say a wider benefit to the local community from a, a water management point of view and then other things ecosystem services cooling potential etc you know the list is uh, is almost endless and I think what one of the things you just mentioned there, and I think it's really important, is a take home message. The more and more I, I look into sort of the wider aspects of turf, turf management, is how interconnected these things are and how much value turf surfaces can be in these wider uh, sort of systems and services that, that are there. Um, to the communities, to the environment, to the ecosystem around, and, and it's it's important to consider. So, in in terms of talking about sort of climate change, future challenges, what do you think are, are likely going to need to be some of the solutions, some of the thought processes we're going to put in place now to start to tackle and cope with those challenges when they come? Yeah, I think. Um... A traditional way of doing things is, is going to have to change. There's going to be 80% of it, which you're not going to change. I mean, a, a drain is a drain and there's the, the very efficient ways of getting water out of, um, I'd say, golf greens or football pitches. The bit that's going to have to change, I think, is the mindset. And um, a lot of the work I've done previously is in is in urban development. And that mindset is particularly in places like London, where they've um, local authorities have been very good at using the stick because you have to use that for any kind of um, development, is saying, look, you no longer can look at the water as a problem. You're going to look at it as a solution. and it's But it's also a solution that you have to deal with on your site. You can no longer just palm it off to someone else. Um, you have to sort it out and, you know, you can do what you like with it, but, you know, it's not our problem. And so that has forced people to be pretty innovative and do things. In London is very different in terms of land value. Um, land value is so much higher, so the solutions can be that much innovative because um, every square metre you save, you can build essentially more flats on and that's 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 kind of pushed a lot of um a lot of the solutions that we've then looked at in in sports turf and tried to kind of make them a bit more economically feasible and a bit more viable for kind of larger areas so that's um i think legislation is going to be a big um a big challenge in the future because that will come um 
we're probably not as quick as some countries. We're probably quicker than than other countries. Obviously, with our um, with us leaving the EU, that's going to be interesting to see how that will change things. Whether or not our environmental legislation will get stricter or or less strict. Um, but that's going to be the big one for people that will really affect people from a do it now sort of thing because if you're not prepared for it suddenly you can be breaking the law and examples of that may be discharging water off your sites in the past we've been very used to just connecting into a drain and just saying you know see you later um, and I think people at like the Environment Agency are going to be and we're in conversations with them at the moment in relation to this um, RNA project that's one thing that they are really cracking down on now because obviously when it floods you've seen even in February March the chief exec has to get out his wellies and go and stand in front of a flood barrier and explain to people why the houses are flooded and you know they will be looking for scapegoats and um, whether or not it makes a massive difference um and then on the other hand you've got water companies who have to provide the water and they've got the other problem where they're saying hang on a minute there's not enough water to go around are we going to supply water to this new housing estate of say five thousand people that in our local plan that we are required to build or we're going to carry on supplying it to the golf course up the road um so the, you've got two conflicting kind of government bodies there with two conflicting um views so that's purely from a legislatory point of view obviously the the practical aspect is a much more likely to be a slower gradual change but as the previous years have shown you can get kind of spikes when suddenly it becomes a very real problem and it's not like it's a problem in 30 years time it's a problem today that's only going to kind of continually get harder and harder to deal with uh, I, 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 yeah absolutely right and we're going to have to think about innovative and creative solutions um and solutions are going to have to evolve there are plenty of solutions out there which are going to be really useful and i think sometimes it's just thinking creatively about how we use these these products these systems in a way which is going to be beneficial um, and, and and compatible with, with with sports turf management. So, got a couple of questions come up um, um, that we can we can have a have a little go go at. Um, so, Peter McMorran has asked, what moisture content should be targeted to maximise mineralisation of organic matter by microbes during the period when soil temperatures drives microbial activity? And that's really sort of really great question, Peter. Uh, and the answer, I think, is what we're looking at is a moisture content between, not to be facetious, between permanent wilting point and field capacity. But however, that's a pretty wide range. So if we think about where the grass plant is happiest is also luckily, well, not luckily, it's all interrelated. That's the point. It's interconnected. That's the point at which the microbes are going to be happy and healthy and that microbial community is going to be active. So we must have water films in our soil. That's where the microbes live. We've got to have some soil water in there. We do need air spaces in there. That's really important as well. So when we talk around, when we talk about for most typical um, sort of soil environments, if we're maintaining um, soil moistures around 15 to 30 percent generally i would say my gut feel is around about 20 uh, to 25 percent moisture content is where we've got a balance between water films water fill pores which is the habitat for our soil microbes and at the same point it's 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 it, it allowing air space and, and, and air capacity into our soil uh, for for whatever air exchange can take place but also for, for future drainage um, and water bringing the resources dissolved um, oxygen dissolved nutrients into that profile so i think certainly we're in that that ballpark for good healthy plant growth in the same kind of conditions for uh, good mineralization. I guess the question is, depending on what you're trying to mineralize, how you're trying to mineralize it, and where you're trying to mineralize it within the profile, very much determines it. So if you've got a, a very saturated waterlogged profile, there's probably a reason why you've got very little mineralization and essentially a peat bog um, forming. Um, it's because it's too wet for the for the for the microbial community so that's that's i guess where we're at and i think that's that's where from what i've seen from the, the papers i've written from hands-on practical research where i i see that, that the most benefit occurring so peter that's a really good question um i think tom we're we're um we're sort of straying now into sort of territory of, of sort of landscape water management um and so there is there is some interesting sort of potential takes on, on on water management at the landscape level 
what do you think are the long term development we, developments we're going to need to consider in sports turf to really help make us future proof more and our sports facilities more resilient? And sometimes thinking a little bit left field and outside the box. Yeah, I think it's um, depending on what sport you have. I think there's there's one. Um, which we, we're incorporating a lot into our design ethos now is that whole facility wide look at um, look at something. So water is a really great example of that drainage. Too often you've a sport thinking of a sports stadium um, in the design process. We'll get brought in, exa- for example, and we'll design the pitch drainage. Uh, and then at some point we'll connect into a, a pipe and someone else will do the drainage for the roof of the stadium and maybe someone else does the drainage for the, the car park. And no one's really speaking to each other and saying, what are we doing with all this water? Everyone's got in their own little bubble and they've got their own problem to deal with. So I think in terms of the way of designing, that is the thing that has to change first, is that that mindset that um, no matter what you're looking at, and water is just merely one of these things, you have got the whole uh, site to deal with and then, you know, use it, use it to your advantage. Uh, we've been looking at that for a number of kind of high profile stadiums where we're saying, look, all the water off your roof of your stadium, we'll take that, we'll, we'll keep it under the pitch for you. And you speak to a civil engineer and they go, you know, cheers, mate. That's, you've really <laughs> solved a really big problem for us because we're in a city. Um, if we dig down, we're hitting clay. You know, where we, well, we didn't really know where we we're going to put that water. And now suddenly you've said you stick it underneath the pitch. And then and then you speak into the ground to me saying, well, hang on a minute. Why don't we use that water to irrigate the pitch now? Obviously, they're going to be concerned about uh, the cleanliness of it. But there's, there's ways of cleaning water. Yeah. Um, you know very efficiently and then suddenly you've you've dealt with two problems there and you've got a fantastic integrated solution so i think that's the that's the big thinking outside the box is traditional design work is very um and not bad mouthing engineers it's a very slow process to change people's my, way of doing things that they've always done absolutely i think that links directly into to john's question there which is are we seeing suitable advances in rainwater harvesting across all sports facilities and, and from what i've seen tom correct if i'm wrong i'm certainly seeing that there's a lot more solutions out there there's a lot more creative thinking about solutions that are out there and it's talking to the right people engineering them in in the right kind of way so whether it's looking at whether it's whether it's looking at ponds or lakes whether it's looking at subsurface storage tanks using systems like what well, off the top of my head permavoid for example would be really important a way to actually store and hold this water and there are there are a whole load of solutions and most of these are coming from water attenuation civil engineering we've got to take that technology and use it for us tweak it for us and, and be able to get the maximum value from it yeah exactly i think mean- the solutions are out there and they can be come in very simple forms or very complicated forms. Um, but generally, they're all trying to do the same sort of thing. The complicated thing, in my opinion, is actually getting people to think about it early, early on to get maximum benefits um, from that. Because if you do bits and bobs, it, it's never going to work. And one of the biggest problems you'll have from a big design point of view is cost value engineered. Um, is solutions being valued engineered out because on paper, it may look like um, the solution you've said, we've got this fantastic rainwater harvesting, et cetera, et cetera, but it's 30 grand more expensive than a you know bog standard connection to the mains. And it's getting past that mindset and saying, well, 10 years time, 20 years time, what is the life cycle kind of cost for this? Um, and generally what you find if you do, you, if you do it properly, these types of solutions come out as a lot cheaper. Uh, and that's with in today's kind of legislative climate. In the future, there's going to be more and more options. Um, a good example is is anyone based in the northwest. I think other water companies will follow shortly. But United Utilities, they they offer a scheme of if you reduce the amount of water you're discharging um, to the main sewage system, you actually get a rebate back. So that is kind of cash straight in your pocket because they're they're essentially saying it's cheaper for us to give you two grand a year than it is for us to make our pipes bigger. That's that's essentially what they're saying. Um, but you can really use that to your advantage. Um, but part of the problem in the design process is that isn't even thought of. It's just looked at gravel, say, versus a permavoid system. And I know we've had that problem a few times, um, trying to convince people that actually in the long term, this will save you money. 
Absolutely. I think it's difficult when it's on the bottom of a spreadsheet where you're just looking at one particular factor. I think Gwyn is making a really valuable point there. So Gwyn's uh, raised the, the, the point of the rainwater harvesting is, is commonly used in all walks of life in tropical and subtropical areas where infrastructure for water supply is often lacking. So using this model, do you think sports turf can help with future guidance for attenuation? And absolutely, I think we do. And I think that sports turf, the, the fact that we are so focused on water management, water is critical to what we do, um, storing or, or, or dealing with excesses as well as then shortages um, is really important. And I think we're now looking at much wider um solutions to to how we harvest rainwater um and, and sort of tom what from your experience looking at this from for various projects i mean uh, how realistic do you think water harvest rainwater harvesting is in that that sports concept con, uh, context yeah ma massively it's uh the opportunity is there and it's only going to get bigger and bigger it's the biggest hurdle often is is convincing people that it's doable and it's because it is so left field and, and out there and and depending on where you are you can actually you know 30 40 percent of your water demand you can actually uh, generate from rainwater harvesting and that's on say something like a football pitch where the actual catchment area is quite small you take that to something like a golf course where you're you're dealing with a seriously big uh, land area and this is what we're looking at, at doing as part of our rna project is, is trying to speak to some of the key stakeholders like the ea and water companies and saying um look there's a massive resource here and golf as an industry has traditionally been very bad um at kind of saying we're doing quite a good job here um how can we help you further and there's a number of reasons for that um and uh, you know the the argument goes the other way the ea as i'm finding is is you know is a big organization finding the right person to speak to can be can be quite tricky like any big organization um but the opportunity is there is is definitely there it is purely the, the willing and i think Grim makes a very good point that it's sometimes we've overcomplicated things um we've had the luxury of having automatic irrigation systems water wall irrigation if we needed it um, and that was when times were good and sometimes it's quite to go back to basics and go to some of these places where they don't often have that say the the, the modern day technology and they've had to make do and you'll see actually some quite innovative solutions um a really nice example i think there's a there's a town in spain um where they've still got some really ancient water harvesting um and this is just like just stone channels built into the hillside uh, and it's still there standing. I think the Romans built it 2000 years ago, or the, maybe the Moors even before that. And they um, they harvested water when it rained and it went to the city aquifers and that system's still building. And, you know, ultimately, that's a very simple system. It doesn't have to be complicated. Absolutely. And and I think sort of uh, Gary Smith's raised an interesting question here, which is, is pertinent to both the UK and the global context. Do you expect an increase in the use of grey water in the turf industry going forward? So what, what do you think about that, Tom? Is that a realistic expectation? Yeah, definitely. I think grey, grey water is, um, is quite a, a loose term. Um, you've got grey water in the sense of uh, drainage water. And that makes me probably a bit less nervous because water that's gone through an existing draining system is probably going to be pretty clean. Uh, you can store it on a, an on-site and potentially treat it again. It gets a bit more tricky when you're starting to talk about grey water from buildings. Uh, and that requires a bit more thought and a bit more fiddling around because you're separating. You, you're obviously not going to use um, sewage water, but for things like taps and showers, you can start to use that water um especially if you don't mind occasional kind of bubble blooms in your irrigation ponds and stuff but that way of thinking is is occurring more and more now especially places with um hotels for example where they have a larger amount of uh, people people doing them but a lot of this comes down to employing the kind of the right people to come and actually almost audit and calculate these things for you um because there's no point putting a load of infrastructure in and then suddenly you've only got one person having a two minute shower a day you know it's not it's it's impractical and the same with the rainfall um actually working out when your rainfall is going to fall and how it's going to fall uh, and when in the year it's going to fall because all these things mean you kind of have to work backwards to do a, a more efficient design uh, absolutely and and often design phases are critical and the design of these systems and solutions is critical for their ultimate success and it's thinking just beyond the tech 
it's thinking about the realities of how they're going to be used. And and just to complete the trio from 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 Eric here, uh, started off with a fabulous question and is now sort of three questions in another cracker. Um, there is work being done on sur subsurface irrigation for golf and sports. Is there research on how much more efficient these systems are compared with overhead irrigation? Um, for example, evapotranspiration, target application, root plant development. And I think sort of, Tom, you can speak from a little bit of uh, uh, sort of a, a personal experience of having done some fundamental research or SRI certainly does fundamental research on these systems. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think um, inherently any subsurface irrigation system in, in any walk of life is going to be, if it's designed correctly, it's going to be more efficient. That's just because you're you're not putting water on the surface. Um, and obviously the warmer and the windier the climate is, the more that water just gets taken away. Um, and so this, this way of thinking in horticulture, for example, um, subsurface irrigation or below ground irrigation has become a, is a much bigger deal because it's it's obviously much easier to do with with plant plops but they've seen savings you know massive savings um over the years i think sports turf has been relatively late to the party compared to other industries for a number of obvious reasons um but the, the technology is the same and going back to kind of my green roof um experience a lot of this work has been done in green roofs time and time again before it was done in sports turf and the exact kind of same results rang out where irrigating from below you naturally save water um just because you're you're not getting that evapotranspiration but then at the same time you can actually irrigate much more it's more of a kind of a slower gruntier kind of way of irrigating it's less kind of a flash in the pan and chucking it on you're more kind of thinking 24 hours ahead and that's where you're really reliant on the system to slowly feed um what you need and that's where we've done a lot of research um, over the last six, seven years in the UK, Australia, Qatar as well. So some very kind of contrasting environments. Um, and generally what all we've seen is water savings of between about 30 to, to 60 percent in very hot, windy conditions wow. compared to conventional irrigation. So that's um, and that's purely just from irrigating from below. You're not using different types of water. You've not got different grass species or different root zones. It's purely the fact that you're you're irrigating from below and that water goes up into the root zone and hits the, the plant root straight away. You're not having to mess around and whittle your way down to the root before it gets into the plant. You, you're straight at your kind of uh, action zone. I mean, and, and that's and that's a great statistic, isn't it? I mean, if you're on average saving a third of your water just by by irrigating from below, you're, you're the same systems that we've been looking and researching also act as attenuation storage systems. But at the peak, when things are at their hottest, looking at potentially 60 percent water savings, I mean, that's that's tremendous. And for some development and increment uh, investment up front, long term benefit and cost reduction as well as plant benefit will be huge so i think that's a it's a really great question eric and i think it's something we are going to have to think a lot more of especially when we're talking about being as absolutely efficient as we can be when it comes to every drop of water that we have access to and if we have to rely more and more on what's landing on site and having to use it then these kind of systems will be really uh, well, essential in the future for future developments and retrofitting where we can do into existing sports surfaces. So, yeah, a great question. Um, and there are we've got a few more questions here. We'll, we'll, I think it's worth plowing through some of these questions, um, even if it does mean going a little bit longer. We do like to talk here at STRI, or certainly I do. And I know Tom likes a good gab as well. So good question here from Adam. Do you feel underground wireless sensors are a distinct advantage when making these water management decisions? Uh, oh, yes, great webinar, by the way, guys. Thank you very much, Adam. Always good to get a bit of praise. Pat me on the head. I'm a happy man for the rest of the day. Um, but you raise a really interesting question and point. And Tom, I know you've got a tremendous amount of experience uh, when it comes to looking at integration of te sensor technologies into analytics and management systems. Um, so what do you think about sensors and wireless sensors and, and sort of spatial measurement? Yeah, yeah. I mean, ultimately, they're a, a great tool to have in your armory. Um, a word of warning, they're never going to replace the greenkeeper on the ground, practical experience. Um, wireless sensors in particular, I think from a golf point of view, are, are very, and a football pitch to a certain point, um, 
are very useful because obviously you can move them, you can install them very easily. Um, obviously, very easy to lose as well at the same time. Um, but what it does allow you is that degree of flexibility. Wired systems are probably a bit cheaper, um, but of, uh, getting them installed can be a bit more of a, a nightmare. One word of a warning, I think, from any sensor system, and I think you've experienced this just as much as me, Chris, you can suddenly be overloaded with data. So it goes back to your core question of what data do you actually need to make a decision and what is important to you? Um, and there's a kind of a, a good example. We've installed our turf sync system up at our hearts. It was the first full install, and we, we just only had 12 sensors across the, a football pitch, um, and they were taking data once an hour so not even a huge amount of data um that was just essentially just telling you is the pitch in the right range it wasn't giving you that minutia kind of minute by minute change and in the space of a year we had something like a million data points in our data set um and so you do end up with a lot of data and then you really need to know what you're going to use that for so i think that's a word of warning but generally in the, in the right hands they're great kind of assets to have in your armory um, and especially the way that irrigation management should be going is the you're irrigating um, more based on kind of science and figures rather than just gut feeling. Um, I think there's always going to be a balance between the two because you don't want to just be led by the numbers and chase kind of chase the number. because That sometimes can be inappropriate as well. So there's, there's going to be a balance between the two. But overall, yeah, definitely a good a good tool to have. And the way I've, I mean, I've been involved with sort of, I'm a scientist, I'm a nerd, I'm a geek, I'm a, I, I put my hat on. Um, I love numbers. I love trying to work out problems and solutions. And one of the things sort of coming at this that have been involved for, for, for over, well over a decade now in measuring and assessing sports surfaces is really all of these tools, all of these measurement systems, they're exactly that. It is a tool. They can help in decision making. The thing that makes a decision is you the human being the turf manager but what these systems can do is help you give you extra sets of eyes help you sense and detect things in the environment that you perhaps don't necessarily see and, and i think it's choosing the right system not all systems are the same we've seen that before you can get 10 different moisture sensors and depending on how they're calibrated and how they're operating they can give you different results so what you need to do is build a baseline on your course on your situation on your pitch um, but yeah these tools are very important but you made a great point tom and i think it's really valid because i've seen a lot of systems fall down on this which is paralysis by analysis we need th these da these data to come out of these systems and in, and and pre present it in a way which allows decision makers to make decisions not be swamped by a plethora of statistics numbers indices what you need to know is you need that nasa like system you go no go that's what you need the data to give you that decision so i think the tools are often there. Often it's the back end, it's the analytics that need to go hand, sort of go along and evolve to make these useful systems. And I think that's where we're at. Yeah. And I think um, the other point to make as well is kind of temporal change throughout a day is not something to be scared of. And that's it's a purely natural thing to have. And this is we were talking a bit about this earlier with what's the optimum range for kind of mineralization. And again, it's 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 a target and that's what it is. And soil will fluctuate randomly and i think a lot of people when they first get these sensors in the ground can sometimes scare themselves because they're actually fluctuating quite a bit and that's no bad thing at all to have um and you can almost you can be chasing kind of an impossible dream sometimes i think the, the, the more that you know absolutely and I, and I think that's that's sort of it's important to make sure you have a solid grounding. And, and for me, it's always been when discussing and talking about objective measurements, objective assessments, no matter what it is, it's always the melding together of the science on one hand with experience, expertise and what your eyes are taught, seeing and sensing. And it is the interface between the two, which is turf management. And I think that's an important point. There are a couple of questions now I think would be worth it's just worth going through. Um, uh, Alan has asked the question, how many golf courses actually carry out testing on their irrigation system, whether it's up to date or working efficiently? I think, Alan, that's a really valid point. And as we've seen in previous years, I've had numerous conversations with groundsmen and greenkeepers. And certainly the, the summer of 2018, for example, caught a lot of us with our pants down. We kind of had to put more water through our systems and all of a sudden 
it was like, oh, that's not quite as even as I thought it was, or oh, that pipe's just burst because it's a little old and needed to be replaced. You're right. I think we do need to take care of our, it, that infrastructure like irrigation system. And though it was your triple mower or any other piece of machinery, it does need regular checks. It should be regularly calibrated. Do your catch can test. Absolutely. I think it's critical. It's exactly the same league as making sure your sprayer is operating effectively and calibrated. It's all for me in the same ballpark. Sometimes I know the feeling it can be easy to overlook it or manana, 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 manana comes and it's already like, whoa, I need to get water on yesterday and you've got a problem. So it should form for me part of a routine maintenance plan. Um, and I think it's a really good point, which is why I thought it was worth making. It's a great question, Alan. Just a bit of shameless publicity as well, Chris, um, relating to the, the RNA 2030 projects, which we're involved in. Um, there is a questionnaire that will be going out uh, which is jointly done on agronomic uh, questions and water questions. Not very many, uh, so hopefully not too arduous, but they're the kind of questions that we're quite interested in. How old, for example, are people's irrigation systems? You know, obviously a newer one probably requires uh, less fiddling around with every year than maybe an older one. Um, but that's a, a, a really a nice way of seeing can people save water from simple simple fixes or is it a much bigger problem? Uh, uh, yeah, and I think uh, more information we can have. It's all about a particip participatory sort of program and project, um, these golf course 2030. So you will see stuff coming out from SRA as well as the other project groups. And it is important that folk can take the time just to fill it in, even in these sort of times where we're all perhaps working a little harder than we used to do because we may there, there may be staff on furlough on golf courses or sports facilities. But it is important to help direct future change, future policy, future understanding. And so I think as we start to come towards the end um, uh, about sort of with this with this um, uh, uh, stream, there are a couple of questions or certainly well, at least one more question that's, that's certainly worth talking about briefly. I'm aware we've been talking for 50 minutes, so we'll try and wrap it up um, in the in the next few minutes. But Benjamin's uh, raised a really interesting point. Um, maybe it's uh, I've just uh, so is there any chance of creating some type of GMO grass species which are more drought resilient? And, and to answer that, um, certainly um, I absolutely the plant breeders are looking at this, whether it's GMO or not. Ultimately, um, that, 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 that's down to regulatory uh, impact. GMO will speed the process up considerably over traditional plant, plant breeding, where you're doing your crosses um, and taking those individuals which are most adapted to a particular circumstance. Um, but absolutely, breeding programs are really important and species for me, Tom, I don't know what you think about it, but certainly getting the right species for the right habitat is really critical when it comes to just just grass species and water management. Yeah, definitely. Well, we we see it all the time out on our trials ground. With we're very lucky to have a, a range of species and um, individual cultivars sat next door to each other, and you can kind of see the the changes almost hour by hour, can't you? With some of them, um, some of them absolutely loving dry conditions, and some of them just falling over as soon as you get a, a whiff of sunshine. Um, but just to go back to your point as well, I think absolutely genetically modified organisms, if you really wanted to, you could do some pretty funky things straight away. The thing that holds it back, like many things, is the legislatory framework behind it. Um, for good reason, you don't want to be rushing into these sorts of things. Um, I think everyone has their own opinion on it. And the science probably was put back 20 years or so by certain movements in the in the 90s kind of maybe being a bit alarmist about it um but i think in the next 20 years you, you can't see um genetically modified organisms coming out in the, into the grass um into the immunity market if you're going to see it, it's going to be more um agricultural sort of crops i think first so as chris said it is kind of conventional breeding that is going to um we're going to see the the breakthroughs and in reality the way that conventional breeding works now i think all the quick wins were, were made when we first started and now it's um it's that extra 0.1 1 percent that the breeders are getting because because they're already at such high quality you know you kind of it's very hard to improve and have those big steps these days and and one of the things that I talk about quite often when we're doing training courses or someone gets me on a soapbox is very much localised adaption. So if we look at what's growing in particular environments around your golf course, for example, so um, we look 
I walk around our trials ground frequently and I look at the tops of our south facing embankments. What grasses do I find predominantly? Fescue, because these are the driest areas that we've got and that's where the fescue is likely to grow. I look down the bottom of that same embankment where it, it's close towards a catchwater drain. It is wetter, there is more soil moisture and botanically they're very different. So you do get different grasses growing in different habitats, but also I can go onto other areas where I know we have grasses that if you look in the textbook would say they don't tend to like drier conditions and they're happy as Larry sitting there growing away because what's happened over time we've had we've had Darwinian Darwinian I can't even say it Darwinianism um, we've had we've had evolution going on so those individuals that are most adapted for that habitat have survived they've thrived they've bred they've created a natural population and part of strategy might be looking at helping to create a, so, so if you're sitting in a very wet environment or an environment which is very changeable in moisture content and condition then that's going to be quite difficult to parachute in individual grasses and expect them to flourish sometimes it's a combination of trying to get conditions right architecturally engineering your conditions to suit grasses and, and adaption over time as well as supporting that um, with um, supporting that with 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 individual um, uh, sort of grasses that we might put in to help keep the the turf better quality, happier and healthier over longer term. So, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff on the breeding side, and that's part and parcel of the longer term, if you like, strategies that are going on. But I think I'm getting a, a nudge, nudge, wink, wink from uh, from our marketing and comms team to say, shut the chuff up, Chris. You've been talking far too long about water management. Um, but, you know, we love talking to you guys. We love interacting. We love the questions. It's been fabulous. Really enjoyed it. Really great question. Thought-provoking questions and covered all the topics we want to talk about. So very much, thank you very much from me. Uh, really appreciated. Uh, you guys staying with us and, and chatting to us about all things water management. So I'll hand over to Tom, so Tom can say his goodbyes as well. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. Really enjoyed it. Hopefully see you again. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for the questions and uh, being so interactive. Absolutely. So guys, thank you very much. Again, if there's any more questions you think of after the event, put them in the in, in the chat channel. Um, we will respond to them um, sort of offline. Um, and stay safe. And tune in next next week, Wednesday, 4 o'clock, where there'll be another topic, another discussion, and uh, look forward to seeing you all then. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.